This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, in uh, 1919, uh, James Henry Breasted, who was uh, director of the uh, Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago, uh, decided to go on a research trip to Egypt and throughout the Middle East. He invited a few colleagues along, people from the Metropolitan Museum, colleagues at Chicago, and uh, William Arthur Shelton, who was a student of his and who had come to Emory as Candler Professor of Theology. While in Egypt, Shelton made some very important purchases. He knew then as now that mummies were particularly exciting to the public. So he went to Abydos, which was one of the richest archaeological sites in Egypt. Uh, and when he was there, he bought a mummy thinking it was a pre-dynastic mummy. It turned out to be an old kingdom mummy. But this was even better because there are so few of these left to us. There's probably less than a dozen in the whole world. And this is the only one in the Americas. So it was uh, very important, but in a very uh, poor state of preservation given its great age. Uh, so it was apparently on display for a short time when he brought it back from Egypt. But for many, many decades now, it's been in a crate in the storerooms. When Peter decided that he wanted to display this mummy and finally convinced me that we should at least examine it again and try to make the mummy more complete for the public, I certainly wouldn't have wanted to take on this project without Mimi Levesque. Mimi is a conservator of objects and textiles and has probably more experience than anyone in North America in treating ancient Egyptian mummies. first time I looked at it, I was amazed that there was anything even standing there and I looked at Peter and said, there is no way I can do anything with this. It would be easier to put together a bag of crushed potato chips. This mummy is so different from any other mummy that I've ever had the opportunity to work on because of the position that he's lying in. Most of the bodies that we work on are lying flat. They're completely horizontal. They're contiguous. You can sort of, you know, their limbs aren't sticking out, but in this case, his head is raised, his arms are, one is up, the other is down. Because of that, gravity had pulled the upper arm off. The knees are balanced against each other, but it's a very precarious balance. So he's really fighting gravity just by the position that he's in. And then the condition of the linens was far worse than any other body that Mimi had worked on or that I had encountered here in this collection. The linens were more torn, there were a lot more big gaping losses. Insect holes are not unusual, but, and neither are tears, but large areas missing and open were not the norm. And then the hands and feet bones were lying there completely exposed with no linen around them, no longer in the position where they're supposed to be. Then, of course, the head was in a separate box. So to have to put all of that back together without any way of supporting the individual pieces as a unit seemed daunting, if not impossible. Because of the fragile state and the, the amount of damage that there had been to the surface, that we were able to actually see right down to the sequence of the wrappings. So we could tell that the very earliest layers were a very coarse, almost like burlap material. And as each successive layer went on, it became finer and finer. There appears to have been a shroud that covered the body and there are fragments of it that lie below the body, and in some cases there are traces of it that remain on the surface of the body. And that was incredibly fine, something that people couldn't do now. One of the most important things we needed to do 
was to examine it uh, with modern medical imaging equipment. And fortunately, Dr. William Torres at Emory Hospital very kindly allowed us to use the radiology department and allowed us to x-ray and CAT scan. That really showed us the sad condition of the skeleton, that the bones were not where they should be, his pelvis is not in alignment, that there are indeed neck vertebrae still around, but they're down inside the stomach area, that the ribs are all as if someone threw them in a horseshoe match and they're just lying around inside the chest. You know, and I think every step of the way I kept thinking, what's going to happen when it all just collapses inside? You know, what happens when this just gives up because there's not enough structure anywhere to support anything? Every project is really a dialogue between the object itself, what it requires and what it allows, and the conservator's skills and capabilities, as well as the curator's knowledge of what the object should be and how it fits within the history. So this dialogue really begins with the documentation of the object. So we had some goals for the treatment. First of all, we wanted to stabilize the body as much as possible because we wanted to make sure that there was no further damage to the mummy. We wanted to be able to restore dignity to the mummy by putting his linens back together, by putting his head on, rewrapping his hands and feet so that none of the bones were exposed any longer. We wanted to avoid damage that was due to any of the methods that we chose for the treatment. So we wanted to ensure that anything that we were doing could be undone in future years we also wanted to avoid altering or obscuring any details of the wrappings because we wanted to make sure that future scholars would still be able to get more information from this body, something that we might not have been able to get as we looked at it. When we first brought the body from storage and opened up its packing to begin the examination, he was covered in dust and there was a lot of dust floating inside and all around and piles of it lying around the body mixed in with the linen and clearly we would have to clean away this dust in order to reveal the bones that we needed to reposition and the linens that we were trying to document and then lay back into place. All this dust quickly became apparent that it was him, it was his tissue that had disintegrated. So we collected all of the, the debris, the dust that had been uh, around the body and put it back inside of Tyvek bags that we made in the lab. Most of the mummies that I've worked on that had been shipped from Egypt in the early 20th century have been stuffed with raw cotton and this one was no exception. Because there was so much space between the linens and the body, they stuck it also underneath the linens, which is something I haven't seen before. That guided our decision to replace the stuffing. And what we ended up using was a polyester batting material that has quite a high loft, it stays puffy, and so we made lots and lots of different shapes of these little puffy pads, sort of almost like little potatoes that could sort of squeeze around areas, tuck in, and really add internal support. That allowed the linens that had collapsed to start expanding and be pushed back out into their original positions. We had to create support without stressing the existing ancient linen and bones. Because there was so much of a, a gap around the long bones, we needed something that could go around them. And so we started to explore tubes and curved shapes that would allow us to fill in spaces. These then could be covered with the linens and it would then start to look like the original wrappings of the body and not be so distracting. We had originally thought we were going to be wrapping the individual fingers as if the hands had been made to wear gloves. And while Mimi was visiting, I got an email from Peter, who was working at Abydos. And he wrote back and said, not gloves, it was mittens. As we were able to find the bottom part of the right hand covering, we realized it was actually more like a mitten, but without the thumb, so that it was completely wrapped. In addition, the bones of the feet were lying just loose on the bottom of the, the base of the coffin. And we were able to find just enough traces to show how the wrappings had gone around the top of the feet, even though almost all of those wrappings had completely disintegrated. We excavated the hands and foot bones, and they were then rearticulated by a physical anthropology student, Catherine Markline, who was able to clean them up and put them all back together in order for us. 
volunteer student interns in the conservation lab became involved in the project to make missing bones. We borrowed skeletons from the anthropology department so that we had references and they, using an epoxy putty, sculpted the missing bones of the hands and of the feet and filled in all the bones that he was missing. We wanted to be sure that we were able to replace all of the missing body parts as much as we could, not just for structural reasons, but because it was important to this individual's religious beliefs. Peter wanted to have the face put back on because most of the Old Kingdom parallels that we have show something like a face, a, a nose, features that make it look as though there is really a face underneath. And of course, we just had the top of the skull. So the first thing we, were, we did was to make a new jawbone. So a mandible was taken from the collection of the Physical Anthropology Department, and that was reproduced. A mask was put on the front of the skull after the skull was wrapped with Tyvek, and then that was held in place with a stocking. He looked a little bit like a bank robber at that point. Then that was covered in layers of linen. Different fiber types look different. So it, we couldn't choose a polyester, we couldn't choose cotton even, because we wouldn't have been able to get the same reflectance. The surface of it would look very, very different if we had chosen a different kind of fabric. So we had to stay with linen. Also, linen has a way of expanding, contracting, and so you want to keep your fiber types very similar so that they respond the same to any changes that might happen in relative humidity or temperature around the, the mummy. So one of the difficulties of matching the new modern linen that we were using was that there are no two places on the ancient linens that are exactly the same color. It was a huge range from almost white to a very, very dark red-brown. So Katie Eatry was able to put together a dye palette that allowed us to dye a whole range of color. And we were able to then make different colors of linen strips that could be used relative to the different colors that were showing up on the body. Peter also found evidence when he was at Abydos of ears that were formed out of plaster and linen, presumably to place on the outside of a wrapped skeleton to give him back the suggestion of an ear. So based on that evidence and the comparisons with the few others that survived, we decided to make an ear out of linen and attach it to our skull. For as long as I had seen this body, the head had lived in another box. So one of the challenges but also exciting aspects was to finally get to put the head back on. And that actually was one of the last steps. We had many conversations with the curator about reattaching the head, what position it should be in and how it should appear. Because the chest had pretty much no structural integrity and the neck bones were not still in position, we didn't have any way to anchor the head on the original skeleton. So we had a wooden dowel cut that would fit in the hole at the base of the skull. We padded that dowel so that it would, could go into the skull. And once that was all set and ready to go, we were able to twist the dowel through the piece of foam that was inside the shoulders and lock it into place between the neck and that foam. And miraculously, it stayed in place. Then the head would need support because it's basically floating in air. And in antiquity, his head would have been resting on a headrest, which would have been provided in his tomb inside the coffin. So our very capable design team um, actually carved a new headrest out of modern wood, and they painted it to look somewhat old and distressed and to match the surviving piece of the coffin. And that headrest serves as a support for the now rejoined head. This was at the dawn of mummification. And the Egyptians were experimenting, apparently, endlessly. So of the few mummies that remain, no two are alike. Every single one is a new chapter in the history of Egyptian mummification. And I think this one will continue to teach us lessons about what the Egyptians chose to use and how they did it. 
A big part of Egyptian mortuary tradition is public display. So you were supposed to be seen and be part of the world of the living. What we do in museums is exactly what the ancient Egyptians wanted to be done. They wanted their mummies preserved. They wanted their names to be spoken again. They wanted to be visited. They wanted to be remembered and preserved for all eternity. And we're helping them do that. I think one of the real excitements and joys of working on a project like this is not only returning something that is rare and interesting and important to a legible state, a way that it can be displayed and made available to scholars and the public to learn from it and understand it and appreciate it, but it's also the process of working with a great team of people who contribute individual skills and knowledge to achieving that project's goals. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.